Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elvad Talk. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Marlon Smith. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Sean. How about yourself? I am awesome. I'm awesome. Dude, so I I saw your tattoo. Right. We're definitely going to have to talk about your tattoo. <laughs> right on. <laughs> but I want what I want to do is I want you to introduce yourself to the people and talk about what led you into heart failure. All right. Well, my name is Marlon Smith. I am uh, live out here in Blanchester, Ohio. I'm 42 years old. Um, food truck entrepreneur, IT professional, um, previous drug addict. Um, I grew up, you know, childhood trauma, you know, all that, the stuff that typically leads to addiction and what have you. And, uh, so the, from the jets of it, you know, I, my diet, my dad died when I was three, um, kind of, which everything kind of, you know, leads into the rest of the childhood trauma and the, all of that good stuff. Um, I don't know. It just, uh, everything was like a big, it felt like a big snowball effect, I guess. Um, kind of go through life chasing this and chasing that and being a musician. And it kind of gave me a gateway out of the the pain and the stress that I was feeling, I guess, from childhood mm -hmm. would be my best example. Um, but, you know, after years and years of, you know, hardcore drug abuse, partying and, you know, being a musician and, you know, neglecting my body like nobody's business. Um, uh, 2004, I was actually diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, I was 24 years old. Um, uh, they implanted me with a defibrillator. And from that point, you know, I, I, I straightened up a lot. Um, I was a heavy meth methamphetamine user. Anything, anything fast, I was all for it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was after that point, you know, I was like, I, it tamed me down quite a bit. But, and then at that point, you know, the, the medication started to work. They was rebuilding my ejection fraction. They was, you know, it was doing the things that it was supposed to do. And I don't know, I think it maybe the, the addict in me got, it, it came back out. And then, cause I never had any issues. I never had swelling. I never had any thing that ever held me back. Mm -hmm. So I typically, uh, you know, I, I eventually just started using again, but it wasn't meth this time. It was, I went to, you know, pills and alcohol and everything, you know, on then on that nature. Um, which obviously was rough for, you know, my wife and myself and, um, and my daughter. I mean, we, I just had a daughter at the age of, you know, 20. So before that point, you know, I didn't have, you know, I don't know. We was all young. So it was just yeah. kind of fly by the seat of your pants, you know? Um, so up until that point uh, in 2019, when I was actually had my LVAD implanted, um, I just, I lived a normal life. I, you know, I changed my life around. I got clean. I went to college. I became an IT professional, um, basically lived the IT life for many years and still do every now and again, you know, mm -hmm. Um, so, well, let me ask you this. So I, I, I came a separate, uh, we're, we have a lot in common. I, right. I worked in IT for many years, many, many years. Right. right on. Before it was cool. I did. It, right? <laughs> Do you think the combination of your lifestyle before, and then, you know, as IT, we lead a sedimentary lifestyle. We're at a desk all day. Do you think the combination of the two, you know, that really didn't help. No, I don't actually think it did. I think the, um, the stress of the job, um, because you never, it, it, you never leave it. It's always with you, you know, and you know, just as well as I do, you're, if you're in it, you're on call 24 seven all the time, right? All the time. And it, it didn't matter. They invented blackberries for us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, exactly. Um, so yeah, I don't think that helped. And I th really think that add to the stress of the drinking at that point. Um, and then a lot of the guys that I worked with at the time also drank a lot. So for me, it was, you know, that was the ultimate, okay, well, if the guys are doing it, I'm, it wasn't so much that they were doing it. I had to do it, but I just felt more comfortable doing it. I, I guess, because that was what I was that was what I was around when I was growing up. You know, the majority of my family was a lot of alcoholics. 
so for me, anything that, you know, the bragging of the alcohol drinking and how much they could drink all became normal. So for me, it was just like, yeah, I guess, I guess today, I guess we're going to go drink a bunch of beer and, right. you know, shots or whatever we had to do. Sure. So, but yeah, I think as, as far as it goes and the stress of it, um, it's definitely, it added to it. It definitely added to it. All right. So what, what led you into knowing after you, you had your defibrillator right. and you, you changed your lifestyle and now you're in the IT. Right. And then what was the first thing that led you to knowing that you were going to need an LVAD? Uh, what, so in what, 2000, go ahead. What set off the sequence of events? Oh boy. Um, so that year, um, I had actually started, uh, I was a professional door installer um, for a, a large manufacturing or large house manufacturing company. Um, and I was out working constantly. I was probably up to drinking almost roughly, I don't know, maybe a, a fifth of whiskey every other day on top of all the beers. And then one day, man, I started getting a real bad pain, like right in my chest area, like, in, like on my esophagus, right in the sternum area. Mm -hmm. And it just, it wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away. And I finally went to the doctor and they started running blood work and it was like, oh, well, it's your gallbladder. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, let, let's see, let's, what do we got to do to fix it? What's got to happen? Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that was before Thanksgiving, um, 2019. And I ended up through, I, I went to the doctor multiple times. They kept sending me for blood work. And then finally, um, my family physician was like, okay, well, so we got your blood work back. You know, we need you to go see this, you know, the surgeon for your gallbladder. Um, I took off, I went and seen the surgeon and he looked at everything and was like, yeah, I don't know if that's right. I'm like, well, okay. I don't, I'm like, well, I don't really care what's going on. Somebody needs to fix me because I <laughs> right. am not, I'm not well. <laughs> um, so come Thanksgiving, I didn't, I couldn't eat anything. I basically put myself on a liquid diet. Um, cause I couldn't, anything that was coming in wasn't being processed correctly. So come January 2000, or I'm sorry. Yeah, it was 2018, 2019, um, January, 2019. And I'm sorry. That was when um, my electrocardiologist actually got a hold of my blood work and was like, okay, you need to get down to Christ Hospital right now. Something is definitely wrong. We don't know what's going on, um, but we already have you admitted. This is, this is, you either need to go there or Bethesda North. And I was like, okay, well, when my wife get home, you know, we'll come back. Well, I'll get down there as soon as I can. Um, so, we ended up getting down there and I remember getting out of the car. And by this time, the swelling was already so bad in my, my shoes that I couldn't even put my, my shoes on barely. They were already completely undone. Mm -hmm. um, how they, they actually asked me how I walked in on my own power. Mm -hmm. um, I was only, my ejection fraction was only at 5%. Ah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I walked in, it was 5%. Um, and I kept saying it was my gallbladder. And they were like, no, 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 no. We, there's definitely something else going on. So from that point, uh, when I hit the hospital, it was January 12th. And then from January 12th to February 18th was the whole process of my whole LVAD install. So it was, um, it was, it was pretty, pretty intense for those, that, that full month. It was like five major heart surgeries in like four weeks. Mm. Yeah. So your LVAD surgery wasn't your first. Yeah, I've never had any other heart surgeries. Oh, I've, yeah, that was my. I went from defibrillator at 24 years old all the way to the age of 29 with no issues, no nothing, and then man, I just I fell completely downhill. And next thing I know, you know, I'm fighting for my life in the ICU. How how did they introduce you to the LVAD? Uh, I was actually, we, I just got admitted and probably within three or four days, um, my LVAD coordinator now, um, actually came up. Um, they, had, they had actually pulled, it was 17 liters of fluid off of my body. Wow. Yeah, it was quite a bit. Um, and then once they started to really find, uh, like do a lot more of the testing and the heart caths and they, they, you know, they basically came in and was like, you know, either you get this or you die. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I was like, well, you got to do what you got to do. Let's make this happen. (laughs) There's no other option at this point. Um, So, yeah, once uh, once my team, you know, kind of showed it to me what was going to happen. You know, we kind of went over the placement of the, you know, the controller cable, how it's got to come out, you know, where I want it, what side I want it on. Um, and it, from that point, it was just like, okay, this is what we got to do. This is happening. So, you know, we got to do this. Is, we just got to do it. Wow. Wow. Do, so did you have to, so you were in the hospital for a while when they introduced it to you. Did you go through the workup? What do you mean the workup? Like when I went through it, they checked everything, like from teeth to all kinds of scans and because they wanted to make sure that it wasn't any other underlying issues. Um, maybe I did, but I think I my blood flow wasn't working as well as it should have been. So there's a, a quite a bit of the pre-VAD stuff that I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um like I said, there's certain spots that I do remember. I do remember shaving before the, before the surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the bits and pieces of like the food and talking with the VAD team about that. But as far as like any of the testing, it was sometimes it felt like a gauntlet and sometimes just, you know, you just couldn't, you know, it just kind of all blended together. When you go to the hospital, obviously, you know, you don't sleep. Right. Right. So they, they just, you run you through a gauntlet of everything. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they was they knew right off the bat what was happening with me. There wasn't any other. It was either do it or die. And mm-hmm. is basically what happened with that. No, so that's I, mentioned, my thought. I mentioned your tattoo before. Yeah. And I got a picture there, of it. Put, all right. Sure. For all, OK, now this is a reason why you guys need to watch it and listen, because this is one of the dopest tattoos I've ever seen. Elva, that's Elvan related. So what I want you to do is explain the tattoo, especially the clock part. Right. So what happened was, is I was already in step down um, when I got the coloring book that my daughter brought me. Um, so I was already doing much better. You know, I was basically learning how to walk again because they had already had me on the ECMO and the, the, you know, the bypass and everything for so long. So I had a lot of time to kill. Um so my daughter bought me this adult coloring book and as a, I'm flipping through it, I find this picture and I'm like, well, this is fitting. Mm-hmm. So I went through and I was like, I'm, this is what I want to do. And I started coloring it. And I'm like, and the more I started coloring it and working with it, I'm like, I got to get this. I'm going to get this tattoo. Not only a, did my daughter give it to me, mm-hmm. but it just, it's fitting for, you know, the, the whole the situation, the meaning. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So as I sit there and I'm coloring it, um, it really has just started dawning on me. I'm like, yeah, I, I got to get this. So when I didn't finish it while I was in the hospital, um, I actually finished it when I was home. Um, but as after I got home and I started going through all my rehabs, um, there was a lot of other things that happened, you know, during the time when I was in the hospital that I wasn't unsure of, but I had like little glitches, you know, like my memory was like, it would flash little things. And no one could ever really give me a, like a full explanation of everything that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember I actually went and talked to my actual surgeon that actually put the LVAD in and he kind of laid it out for me as to like what happened. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that makes a lot of sense, you know, for a lot of the things that I'm seeing. And so I got to talking with my LVAD team and the clock that you, everybody could see on there is actually set for 210. And that was the time that they actually, when that when they when they put me under, um, they you know obviously they do all their prep and whatnot. And when they hit me with the heparin, um, there was a blood clot that actually was in my left ventricle, and it went all the way up through my aorta. Um, I think it was 19 centimeters long, mm-hmm. um, and it completely filled my aorta. Mm-hmm. So, I at that point. Um, Basically, the only thing they had a choice to do was to stop my heart and freeze me. Mm-hmm. So at that point, at that 210, they they froze my brain, not my body, but just my brain to kind of put me in a suspended state of animation, I would suppose is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when they decided, you know, they was going to cut my aorta open and suck a 19 centimeter blood clot all the way out of my body. 
uh, reverse my blood flow, make sure there was no blood clots. And then, so they did that. And, and this is all before the LVAD. This is during the beginning. Right, right. Okay. okay, so so yeah, through this whole point, um, when they started to do that, they actually, when they done that, they sucked the aorta out, sewed it back up, and then put the LVAD in within six and a half minutes. Wow. Yeah. But by that time, I was already on bypass. I was already on the ECMO. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was the big one. That was the one that, you know, them freezing me and going through you know, the motions of what all happened. You know, that that was um, that was kind of a hard pill to swallow that they, you know, they basically said that if I would have been, you know, a little bit older, they wouldn't have done it mm. because they, they're just there was just too much of a risk. But being under the age of 40 at the time that was kind of the the go ahead to you know let's try it what do we what, what do we got this is he's a young man let's do it mm -hmm. wow yeah. so how would do you how much do you remember from your recovery oh yeah i got i can't tell if a lot of it's a bunch of icu delirium mm -hmm. um but i remember quite a bit of the recovery um i remember coming to um and I remember being, I was, I did, of course, obviously I didn't know where I was. Uh, when I came to, I do remember there was a lady sitting next to me, which I thought she was Vietnamese, but it turned out she was my wife, which <laughs> okay. she is definitely not Vietnamese. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then there was a nurse that was, he was walking really funny through the room, like very, I don't know, his angles, the way he walked was like really weird. And I remember like starting to really come to, and I kept hearing all these beeping sounds, which obviously now we know it was all the meds and everything else that's hooked to you. Mm -hmm. um, but I was under the assumption that they had my wife out in the car and they were beeping to communicate to the people in the building because they were trying to hold me hostage to get money out of us to give, you know, uh -huh. so I immediately got like really pissed off. And I started chewing on my tube and they kept telling me like, you know, that's your air supply, you know? And I just kept looking at it and I'm grinding my teeth, just trying to chew this tube in half. And that, that right there was like the, the big, I was awake, I was alive, but mm -hmm. damn, I was mad mm -hmm. because I thought they was using me to get money out of us, you know, for them. And I didn't understand like what was really going on. And you were still in the ICU at this point. Yeah, I just woke up. They hadn't even moved me to like the other bed. It was, uh, yeah, I think it was, um, it was the day before Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I, like I said, I just woke up and I didn't know anything that was going on. And I remember, and I'm trying to talk, obviously not talk when I was intubated. Um, so they held a piece of paper up that had uh, the alphabet on it and I'm trying to close an eye and I'm pointing at the letters, trying to talk to somebody like, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I could keep pointing out was DR, DR, DR. Cause I wanted, I wanted, I, I wanted to see a doctor. Right. And then when my doctor actually walked in and I seen a familiar face, I instantly calmed down and went right back to bed. Okay. It was just a very surreal moment. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not losing my mind. I, mm -hmm. Okay, I've, I remember this guy. I don't even know these two, and I still didn't to that point even and the recognize ICU, that, that was my wife. The ICU delirium is a real thing. And yes, it is. They never tell us about it, and no. this is the second conversation I've had today about it. So it, it's it's a real thing. Like I think I don't even remember it, but it was music for me. I've always been a musician. Right. And my mom was singing, and they played music, and that's what kept me calm. Yes. Yeah, see, I didn't. I didn't have any of that as like as far as somebody to keep me calm, but it was more of a I just knew when I woke up and I, I started putting pieces together in my head that, man, I just instantly got mad and just freaked. I just started freaking out. And once I started to, you know, like I said, once my doctor come in, then I was like, oh, OK, I recognize something. Mm -hmm. I, OK, I know this cat, now, you know, we're, we're good to go. It's not bedtime. I was back mm -hmm. out. So how long after that was it before you were discharged? Um, right after I was discharged on February 18th. So 
I went through roughly, I was, a, I was only in ICU for a week. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was always the, like, I, over, I tried to overachieve any tests that they gave me is because, you know, they want you to get up and walk. They want you to do those little breathing tests. They, mm-hmm. you know, and I was I always, that too. <laughs> oh man, oh man. But once I, you know, once I started to get my, my wits and everything about me again, it was like, okay, the only way we're going to get out of this is just go forward, just keep going and over, overdo what they're expecting and just keep proving to not even more to yourself than them. But you can do this. There's, there's no other, there's no other option. You just have to keep progressively getting better and moving and walking farther and breathing better. And, and that was the only thing that I could ever think of was just be better, just mm-hmm. get better and get out of there. Cause no one loves the hospital. So what was it like once you finally did get home? Um, I tell you what, I had a pretty big welcoming committee. Um, it was, it was pretty nice, but in the same sense, it was like, okay, leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I dropped when I went into the hospital, I was 250 pounds. Um, I'm six, two, six, three. Um, I dropped, I was at 250 when I came home, I was at 208. Mm-hmm. So I was literally just a bag of nothing. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I wanted to do is eat. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to eat steak and real non hot, non hospital food. Yeah, man, <laughs> and just anything good, anything that was you with know, all the flavor. <laughs> oh man, the hot sauce. That's what I'm. I'm a pepperhead now. I mean, I always okay. have been, but you know, the hot stuff. I didn't get a whole lot of that while I was in there. They, you know, and so when I come home, it was like, okay, where's all the flavor at? Because I also um, I run a food truck. Okay. So I've been, and I've, I'd done that successfully for like 10 years, but you know, I've always got into cooking and barbecue and, you know, it's kind of what I, that was my thing. So getting out of the hospital and actually being able to eat some like real good food. Mm, yeah, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I know. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, and nothing makes you happier. And that was, you know, it was kind of, that made me real happy, but the, the struggle was, no one wanted everybody wanted to come around at first and then it, it kind of died off a little bit mm-hmm. which which i didn't mind it because i was still trying to get healthy i was i just bought my food truck almost almost a year before i went into the hospital mm-hmm. so i was still in the middle of building it and you know that that ended that right there ended up becoming my drive to get better to stay you need, busy you need a, you need a motivation yeah 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 i needed the um that motivation to get better and do more things and just stay active instead of kind of laying around in self pity, like, Oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? You know? And, but already, it was like, I already know what I got to do. And this is how, this is what we're going to do with it. Mm-hmm. So I ended up going to my cardiac rehab. Um, I only went like three or four times. Um, I was already used to carrying, you know, five gallon buckets of water from my bathroom in my house out to my food truck to, to, you know, clean it and everything. And I, when I was out walking on these treadmills and I'm like, do you guys have anything that's a little bit more, you know, (laughs) anything that's, you know, a little bit more exhilarating, you know, than what I'm doing? They're like, no, honey, we just, you think you just need to take your time. I'm like, I don't have time for this. Uh I'm already doing way more at home, you know, than I am here. So you'll have a great day. I'll, I'll come back with some barbecue. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so how has your outlook changed since you've had your LVAD? man i'll tell you what um i definitely appreciate things a lot more um i don't put up with no with no crap anymore there was there was a lot of things in my life that i always just kind of let it go or you know i never said anything but it was like you know, after all that, it was like, you know, life's too short. Be who you are. Voice your opinion. Just you, you can't be no one can be mad for you being you. I mean, yeah. I mean, can you be a you know prick sometimes? Well, absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. but I think that's everybody. It just depends on how it is. But as far as the outlook on life, it it's not really changed because I've always wanted the most out of life. You know, I've always wanted to to go and try to accomplish great things or, you know, write a great song or, you know, make the best food or just that strive to always just try to be the best at what you can do. And 
I didn't, I never, I never thought for a second that the VAB would ever stop that. And it hasn't, mm -hmm. you know, that was just, it was just something else I had to overcome personally before I could move on to that, you know, that next process in life that it's like, okay, well, this is what it is now. Now, how do, now how do we go about moving on and still what's, dealing with this? What's the new normal? Uh, waking up every Monday morning and going to get my INR done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did that this morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so, um, you know, I don't really watch what I eat, but I don't really, I never really ate a lot of greens anyway, unless it was, you know, collard greens or, you know, maybe a spinach and a salad every now and again. I was always basically a meat and potatoes guy. Um, so a lot of my food didn't change and thank goodness, cause I am a foodie and I typically, I try to watch my salt, but I know there's a lot of stuff out there that I'm like, okay, like I can eat a whole, I can eat two or three you know, cans of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. And we already know that stuff's loaded with sodium. Is, yeah. 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 And, and I'm good. If I eat one piece of deli ham, man, it screws me all up. Wow. So it, yeah, it's really weird. I, I, ne I never understood that, but um, as far as, you know, yeah, looking at stuff, I, I typically take the time to enjoy things a lot more. Um, I hunt a lot, you know, and I, I got my son into hunting a lot. Um, and also got my son into playing drums. Um, he watched, that was part of my cardiac rehab that I put in for myself. Um, when he was always watching me play and it got him into playing. So you're a drummer? Oh yeah. I'm a okay. drummer. I, I can play drums, guitar, keyboard, bass, everything. I just can't sing a lick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I got him into music and it, the times that I get to spend with him and we're playing or if he comes out hunting with me or just the, it's the little things out there that now that I, I really pay a lot of attention it's different. to. Yeah, it's it is different. different. It mm -hmm. is different. It kind of, it puts you in a whole different uh, mindset, I guess. I mean, you, even the friends you don't see a whole lot, you know, when they do come over, cause I really don't even leave the house anymore. I used to be, you know, the outstanding, you know, social butterfly and run around and do this or play these shows. And I just, I'm not, I don't do that anymore. Typically, you know, I stay home. I mean, I, I got basically everything I need here. I got a studio in the house. I got the woods out back that I can go hunt and I mow the yard and, you know, just kind of hang out here and make stuff's right. You know, um, yeah, it's, you just, I you, think afterwards it kind of changed my priorities. Yes, it did. It, it really did because I used to have an, yeah, before that point, I mean, we had parties at my house every weekend. I mean, and sometimes when we would do a Friendsgiving, I know there was one there was one year I had to direct traffic in my yard because I had like 80 people at the house. Right. Yeah. You know, but it was always the bigger the party, you know, the more the food, you know. And now it's like I just I I kind of like that nice small party, you know. If mm -hmm. if we all do have a get together, you know, it's it's more maybe, you know, 10, 15 people. You know, it's more where I can enjoy the conversations that I'm having with everybody or, you know, it's it's not about bigger and better. It's that quality time that you even spend yes. with all your people, you know, mm -hmm. and I know I think I'm, maybe it's just me, but I know I don't voice it a lot to like my friends and everything. But those little moments like that, man, it, it just means a lot. You know, mm -hmm. it, I don't know. It just it, it does. It completely changes your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I I always end off my episodes with this question. If a young Marlon came to you and asking you about advice on the LVAD, what would you tell him? <laughs> well, would you advice like he's already in a situation that I was? Or about to get the LVAD, yeah. Um it's it, it's either that or die, man. I mean mm -hmm if you, you gotta be strong, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of willpower to do it, yeah. but you, but you've got to have it. And if that's, if that's what it takes to survive and be alive and then, you know, keep enjoying life, then by all means, I mean, you got to do it. You know, it's just something else that you have to deal with in life. You know, it's life isn't easy. We all know that. So, yeah. but, but to, to take it and, 
either don't take it and die or take it and live and learn to adjust to the LVAD life. I, I'm going to take option number two every day because mm -hmm. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what it'd be like not to be here. Mm. You know, I, right. I, tr I truly just enjoy life, you know? All right. So I'm going to give you one bonus question. Uh Oh, <laughs> what is the one thing you wish you would have known about the LVAD before you got the LVAD? Uh, one thing I wish I would have known. Um, the worry for me, it's the worry of if something happens in the house at night, because I, I live out in the country. Um, and actually right now we have quite a bit of burglaries and things and stuff going on, you know, around town and a lot of things that worry me, especially also, you know, being a, you know, well, not a fireman anymore, but I was, but if something happens, you know, the, the thought process of how do I, how do I deal with these situations? You know, mm -hmm. it's not like I can just get up and grab a gun and run, you know, if somebody's breaking in or mm -hmm. if there's a fire, I can you just gotta untie and all that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's, it's, it's this, those life situations that you don't really think about all the time, but until you're plugged into a wall and that's what, that's, that's it. Until you're like, hold on a minute, I got to unplug. Let me get my batteries in you know, and then I can go do my thing. You know, those are the things that are, was never explained, you know, I guess, but I guess that's part of the experience of the VAD, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, and one thing, being a musician, when I stuck a guitar to my chest and you can hear the VAD running through it. Dude, dude. So, <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to talk about this real quick before we go. <laughs> this whole thing here, I until I really got serious into the podcast, yep. dealing with microphones uh -huh. and the difference between dynamic and condenser microphones. Oh, yeah. And I, so I had a condenser and if you can already, you can probably already hear my dog is acting up over here. Yeah, I can hear it. And, and you can hear it, but you really can hear it over a condenser mic, right? Oh yeah. So I need a dynamic mic. I got a cheap dynamic mic, which was my mistake. <laughs> I should have got a one that was more expensive. Right. Afterwards I learned, how, you know, the science of how they're made and the capsules yep. and all yep. that stuff. Well, if you get a <laughs> dynamic mic too close to an LVAD, you get this. Yeah. So you probably got it with the guitar. Okay, so when you put the stethoscopes up to your chest and you can hear the boo doo doo, -doo <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what guitar I put up, especially if it's one that's got like like active EMGs in it. Uh -huh. Man, it's so it just it's everywhere. And I man, I had to put a noise gate on my stuff to and like dial it down to like negative twenty six before it even went away. I went I'm through like. like three mics before I could find one that it really worked. <laughs> yeah. I had to, I noise gated the hell out of my stuff and then I could finally sit down and play it. But then all my sustain was gone. I'm like, what do I do now? <laughs> Hold it out like this, you know, way far, you know, but yeah, it's um, yeah. Little things like that. There's just little quirks that, you know, I, Obviously, no one's even going to tell you about the, you know, the microphones or the guitars. Yeah, or... you can't find that out. But no. I live in. That's the only way to find that out. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, when I told my team, I was like, hey, I was like, you know, when I stick my guitar up on my lap, you know, I'm, I hear my VAD. They're like, hold on, wait a minute. We've, we've never dealt with this before. Let us contact Abbott, you know. <laughs> and then they got back with me. They're like, oh, no, no, you should be fine. I'm like, okay, that's really awkward and weird, but. Yeah, I gotta that make sure, like all the mics are extra RF shielded and the cables. Oh, yeah. And all that. yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah, that's little quirky stuff like that, you know. Um, the joys yeah. of being a cyborg. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. All right, Marlon, what I want to thank you. I really appreciate you coming and spending time with us today. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for listening to and watching LVAD Talk. You can listen on and watch this at lvadtalk.com. If you like it and you want to support us, go ahead and click the buy me a coffee link. Um, Marlon, man, I really appreciate this. You're more than welcome to come by if you want to keep us updated. Or I'm thinking about starting some panels, so you, you're more than right welcome on. to come by anytime you want. Sounds good, my man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sean. That's Marlon, and we out. Peace, Peace out. 
Oh, I gotta hang out. I forgot. We live. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, intro, and we out. Go. <laughs>